Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native, and creator of the Business English Conversations course that teaches you business English. Also a course that will help you with your career to find your vocation, to get better jobs. It teaches you a great system for job searching, for writing resumes, for job interviews in English, all of that. Business English Conversations at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go to Effortless englishclub.com get that business course and join my vip program commit don't quit today we're talking about vocabulary and reading you know we've been doing the reading and listening challenge and i personally have been focusing a lot on listening i have mostly done listening but I don't want to neglect reading. And in fact, now that I'm starting to do some Spanish again, I have realized that actually with Spanish, I'm going to be doing at least half and half. I will do much more reading in Spanish. I plan to. I realize that at my current level, reading is going to help me a lot in Spanish. In Japanese, less. But in... Uh, Spanish much more. So we don't want to neglect the power of reading. So today we're going to talk about reading. And some of you are focused more on reading during this challenge, which is great. And that is a very good choice. We're live on YouTube, so I'll just say hello to a few people who are, as usual, saying hi. Lisa and Ibrahim and Elena and Asma, Asma and uh, lots of our regulars and new people too. So wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. All right, let's just jump in now. So reading. For growing your vocabulary, for going from, let's say, intermediate to advanced level, especially vocabulary growth, reading is number one. There's nothing better than reading, okay? Not vocabulary courses, not, not flashcards, not Anki, none of that stuff, okay? Nothing beats reading. Just reading a lot. Books. When I say reading, I'm, we're talking about reading books. Nonfiction or fiction. Doesn't matter. Okay? But reading books. So pages and pages and pages of English. Okay? This will grow your vocabulary. This will get you to that advanced level better than anything else. So reading is super powerful. Now, listening is great, and listening especially for speaking is important. That's where we get our speaking ability is from listening mostly. And certainly to get to that basic level, the, the level of conversational fluency, we need lots and lots of listening. And I generally say that in the, for the beginning part of your learning of English or when you're start just starting with effortless English, to focus mostly on listening for about six months to really go very intensively on listening, mostly listening. Still do some reading, but mostly listening, 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 learning with your ears. That's exactly what I'm doing with Japanese now. You know, a little reading. I'm learning some kanji, the characters, but um, it's like 90% listening for me right now. It's not easy, but it's very important. That's how we learn the sounds of the language, for example. It's the only way to learn the sounds of the language. You're not going to learn good pronunciation. You're not going to learn how to understand people by just reading. It's not good enough. So listening is number one and most important, especially we need a lot of hours of listening. Yes. However, eventually you reach a point as you get better, as your level gets higher in English, you are getting better and better and better. And you, you become basically fluent, right? You can talk, you can speak English, you can have conversations. You feel like, you know, we might call that the high intermediate level. If you use that B, that, that European ranking, you might call that B2. 
But anyway, you reach that level, and then it's you can feel kind of stuck, like you're just stuck there, and it can feel like, how do I get to advanced levels? How do I jump up to a higher level? Yes, you should continue to listen, of course, but really at that point, that's when reading especially becomes very powerful, because that's when you can really grow your vocabulary, because a lot of what you need to go from intermediate to advanced, a lot of what you need is vocabulary, right? Like some of you say, AJ, I understand you, but I don't understand somebody else. And it's probably just a vocabulary issue. That's probably what it is. It's just the problem is that they're using words you don't know. And I'm using words that you do know mostly. So that's one of the big, that or they're speaking very fast. I mean, these are the two possibilities for why you might not understand someone or why you might not understand a movie, for example, but you do understand me. And so it's mostly vocabulary, okay? You can, it's not grammar, usually, certainly not at this level. You know, you, you, grammar will not stop you from understanding movies, for example. Grammar will not stop you from understanding TV uh, or most conversations. You already know all the grammar you need for that. So what is it then? It's vocabulary. And where do you get vocabulary? How do you grow that vocabulary? And again, it's reading, reading, reading. And we can look at the, you know, the research about this. Uh, Dr. Stephen Krashen's, again, has a great book about this called The Power of Reading by Stephen Krashen. And what that is, it's a collection of all these different studies he found that show how powerful reading is and how it's, it, it, will, it'll, it will help your listening too because you learn more words. It will help your speaking because you learn more words. But most of all, it helps your vocabulary in a huge way. There's no better way. Those of you who want to take TOEFL or TOEIC or some tests like that, reading books is the best preparation for this. It's number one. Better than some test, instead of taking these test books, just read real books. Read lots of nonfiction. Read lots of fiction. That will help you for those tests better than anything else. Now, the main issue then becomes like, what should you read? And of course, rule number one, read things that are interesting to you. Interesting to you. Not to me, not to someone else, to you. If you not interested in the news, don't read newspapers, okay? If you don't like mystery, uh, don't read mystery books. If you don't like romance, don't read romance, okay? There's so many books, there's so much out there that there's no need to read something you don't like. So read something you enjoy. The second challenge, which I have right now in Spanish, and some of you may have in English, the second challenge can be finding the right level because ideally, ideally, you want to read something that's not too difficult. What is too difficult? Too difficult means you have to use a dictionary constantly just to understand each paragraph, each sentence, each page. So if it's too difficult, you're not really reading much because you're just constantly using the dictionary all the time. Too many new words. And that's, it's not efficient. You won't enjoy it. You'll go very slowly. And really, that's just not the best. What is better is to find something where you know, maybe on one page, there are five new words. Five new words per page. That's not bad. Because with five new words per page, you can probably guess the meaning, maybe not perfectly, maybe not always, but often you will correctly guess the general idea of the word because you know the whole situation, you know most of the words. Or if there are only five new words per page or less, you can use the dictionary very quickly, especially with an ebook, you just touch it. If you have an iPad or your phone, you can just touch the word and that you see the meaning and then you keep reading as very fast and you're, and you're not doing it all the time. And you can do some combination. Some words you just guess and keep going. Other words, maybe you really want to know the meaning. It seems important for the story and you're not, you have no idea what it means. So you touch it and you get a meaning. 
So how do you, the, the, the trick though, when you're in the intermediate level, so B1, B2 for the European system, or just, you know, low to medium, intermediate level, it's difficult to find books that fit this, right? Because a lot of books for native speakers will be too difficult. This is the problem I'm having right now with Spanish. Because most books, like I'd love to read Cervantes, Don Quixote, you know, famous. But it's too high. You know, on one page, there are definitely more than five new words. I can't read it yet. I mean, I could read it, but it would be super slow and not very fun. So I'm trying to find, so what can you do? Well, this is where you can, sometimes you can do children's books, but even some children's books might be too difficult for you. Depends on your level. And this is where graded readers, some of you know about these. Graded readers are like, usually uh, have stories, maybe sometimes famous stories, but they use more simple language and they have lots of different levels. So it's easy to find a lot of books at the correct level for you. So I'm just going to show you, if you're watching on video on my screen, I'll show you what I'm doing and what I'm going to do in Spanish. And then I'll show you some in um, in English. And yes, this is related to yesterday's show a little bit. So, okay, first, if you're watching on video, you'll be able to see, uh, well, here it is. Okay, so I just bought some graded readers. I like to do ebooks because of the dictionary, the quick dictionary. But I bought a bunch of them, and you can, if you can see my screen, let me pull one up. Okay, here we go. Here's one. Okay, so there's a lot of these. A lot of people make them now. You can find them very easily. So this one is called Learn Spanish with Stories. And it even has the level B2, which is perfect for me. B1, B2 are perfect for me. Um, una, una chica triste, a sad girl. Spanish intermediate, upper intermediate. So it's perfect. And what's great, look at the price is $1.50. So very cheap. Very, very cheap. And it's fantastic. Uh, I can maybe pull it up. I just bought it, so I can probably show it to you on my screen, the actual book. Uh, I didn't buy that one, but anyway, here's another one. Okay, here's Crimen in Barcelona, Crime in Barcelona that I bought. That's another one. Okay, so boom. It has, you know, here it is, Capitulo Uno. And it just it's just easy. They even have an audiobook version of it, so I can uh, I can download the audio for this. And it's it's fairly easy, like for me. La gente se sorprendió con la noticia. La mayoría de los empleados quería mucho a Felipe. So I can understand this fairly well. I have to go slowly a little bit and think about it, but it, this is about perfect for me. It's like a little difficult, but not super difficult. And... Uh, you know, there'll be some words, but what do I do? I, Boom. See, I just click on this word, muerto, which I know it. But anyway, it means, uh, well, this is actually, I've got, I've got it right now in Spanish. But I could change this to a, an English dictionary. So right now it's giving me the, the meaning in uh, Spanish. So connect. But let's see if I can find my Spanish to English dictionary and show you this. Uh, la, 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 la. I, thought I, had, I thought I had one. Anyway, I'll have to play around with this. I've got one somewhere. It's on my phone. Maybe it's, I don't have it on this computer right now. But what you would do, if, if you're more advanced, you could just use an English dictionary, English to English. But, you know, like a, I could maybe use a Spanish to Spanish dictionary, but I probably will use an English one. Uh, and it would just give me the definition. And you see how fast that is, right? This is on a desktop I'm doing. But you just, I just double click it, boom, and it comes right up. I get a meaning. If I don't know it, I see the meaning. I just look at it very fast, and then I go back to reading quickly. I don't try to memorize it. I don't write it down. I don't put it in Anki. I don't do any of that because I find it destroys the enjoyment of the book and enjoyment of the reading. I just look at it. Cabeza means head. So, cabeza. So, I can kind of understand this Spanish. Uh, I could maybe use the Spanish dictionary for this. Right. So but let's pretend if I don't understand cabeza, then I just double click cabeza. There it is. The meaning. Got it. Keep going. So Braille's escritorio. And then I just keep reading. 
right? And this means it's kind of it's a fairly fun way. It's right at my perfect level. This is great. Now, and eventually, what I'll read a lot of these books, and then of course, then eventually, I want to read the real thing, right? I want to read full books for native speakers, right? I know that just like you do, like you want to read Brave New World, you want to read Animal Farm. Some of you can. Some of you already are doing that, and that's perfect because when you can read the native, right, the 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 books for native speakers, the books that are written for Americans and British people, then you have so much you can read and so many choices that are very interesting and your vocabulary will you'll just grow your vocabulary so fast. But there is the challenge. I know it's this middle challenge in the intermediate levels. And I know that many of you, for example, reading Brave New World was too difficult for you and too slow and the book club helped you and you enjoyed it, but just reading it by yourself was very tough. I understand. Same for me, okay? Same for me. In Spanish right now, like I, like I said, I'd love to read Don Quixote in Spanish, but it's too much. I can't do it right now uh, without it being super boring and difficult. So I'm going to read a lot of these books. So I've got the B2. And then when those are become easy, then they've got other ones that are like at C1 level and other ones that are at C2 level. And I'll just go through a lot of these graded readers Try to get the audio, too. Some of them have audios. And then when finally, when I'm getting like maybe C1 and I'm reading a lot of those graded readers at C1 and they start to feel easy, then I'm ready to move into real stuff, right? Then I can start reading um, full books in Spanish easily. I do it sometimes. Still, I try to do it, but it's not easy. It's, it takes, it's kind of very slow and uh, sometimes I get frustrated doing it. But so you can do this. And then I'll show you now in English. I'm, I'm on Amazon, but most books. So here we have English. It's the same thing. And these are just by like level five. I don't know what that means, but Pearson English graded readers, if you're watching on Pearson. So there's a few companies that make these in English. And this is level five. What, uh, they're probably on the back. It says it tells you what this level five mean. It probably has, you know, like how many words it or something. But anyway, level five, Sherlock Holmes short stories. So maybe reg maybe the real Sherlock Holmes stories are just too tough, right? It's, it's, it's too advanced. So what do you do? Well, first, get some graded readers and read Sherlock Holmes short stories. And these are at a much easier level. You're going to get, they're the same stories, but written with easier vocab. You're going to still learn a lot of vocabulary. And you'll read a lot of these level five, right? So let's looking here. And you, you can do like a couple levels. Like if you're level five, you could get level four, five, and six. The level six would be a little difficult for you. Level four would be a little easy. Level five would be perfect. But you could get all those and just get a lot of them. And these are like six dollars. So they're a little more money, but some of them are like one dollar, okay? You, they're fairly cheap. But you can see level five, round the world in 80 days. That's another famous story. Les Miserables. I, mean, I don't know how you say this in English. It's French, but the miserables. Crime and Punishment, another famous book, but it's level six, so they made it easy. They even have Shakespeare. The Merchant of Venice is a famous Shakespeare play. Now, regular Shakespeare, I don't recommend. It's not modern English. But a graded reader... They're giving you the same story of this play, The Merchant of Venice, the same story, but they're using normal English, modern English, meaning not modern, and it's a level four, so fairly easy English. And so you can just do, you can read a lot of these books. You can get lots and lots and lots and lots of them, level five, level six. And then after you read a lot of these, your vocabulary will grow in an enjoyable way. This is more fun than doing Anki cards. This is more fun than doing flash cards. This is much more fun than studying some vocab book, trying to memorize lists of vocabulary. It's more fun than all that stuff and more effective too. You actually learn much more vocabulary, much faster this way. And you do it reading these interesting stories. Many of them are kind of famous stories. So it's perfect. Then what do you do? After you read a lot of graded readers, then you're ready. Then you go and you read the real thing. Like Larissa here. Larissa says, now I'm reading Sherlock Holmes. So Larissa Pokrova. 
So there you go. So maybe you read a lot of these graded readers, and then you're ready to read the full books, the full ones for the natives. So you go read the real Sherlock Holmes. If you liked it, you could read the real ones by um, Conan Doyle. You could read a lot of several of those. You can read another one. You could read anime, right? And manga. Anime is the video. Manga. You could read manga. Comics. Those are kind of nice. They're kind of conversational. And they're also a little bit easier. So you might do graded readers, then do manga, and then do full books like novels. And you can choose whatever you like. And this is a good way when you're stuck in that middle level like I am with Spanish, you're stuck in the middle level and you're, ah, the real stuff is too tough and the, the stuff for learning is too easy, you know, like you're, you're sick of lessons and things like that and you need something right in the middle. Graded readers are really good. All right, let's go into the questions and comments now. All right, let me just jump back. Okay, well, this is a question when asked, it's, it's a common question, how much vocabulary do we need to get to the advanced level? You'll see different numbers, okay? Uh, it depends what you mean by advanced. But if let's say we're talking about native speakers, native speakers, how many words do native speakers know? Educated, you know, like someone who, meaning they graduated high school, I guess, I don't know. Um, it would be something like twenty to 30,000. Is the mo the common number I see, twenty to thirty thousand words, and that's um, if you want to be technical, specific. That's word families, meaning, uh, so you count like all the versions of a verb is just one word. So like you know, go, went, <laughs> would uh, would be counted as one word because it's the same to go. It's the same verb, right, and has different versions. Um, but you would only count that as one word. So if you're counting words like that, you know, I don't know. I've never done, I've never counted it myself, but according to different researchers, something like 20,000 is a good number, 20 to 30,000. So that's a lot. Now that's maybe the bad news because <laughs> that's a lot. And that's why you have to read. And audiobooks are also great, by the way. Uh, it's, it's great to read and then listen to the same. Uh, book but listen to the audio so first read it normally with your eyes and then if you want to you could then listen to the same chapter or the same book with the audio you get both then but anyway the good news is for really like normal everyday basic conversations you won't most people only use like eh, three to five thousand words so just a function is not so bad. That's kind of that intermediate level, right? B2 in, in the European system, upper intermediate, I would call it. So that's nice. That's That can get you, you know, basic fluency. You could say 5,000 words. But then to jump up to that advanced level where you're close, getting close to native speakers, where you're talking about quite advanced topics, then you that's a big jump. You know, that's 15,000 more words at least. How do you make that big jump into that advanced level? Reading and audiobooks is real. It's the best way. Dico says, is two hours enough for listening each day? Yeah, two hours is good. Two hours is decent. I would say that's kind of the minimum, and it's you'll make decent progress. Try to do some reading if you have some time also. <laughs> How? What's the crack, teacher? Now, this must be, I'm thinking, I believe that is Scottish, if I remember. Crack, C-R-A-I-C. -C. It's definitely not American. I don't think it's, Br I don't think it's uh, British. <laughs> I don't think it's English. Crack. Is that Irish or Scottish? I don't remember. But anyway, it means what's up. What have you been up to? How's your Japanese? Um, do you know Meetup application? Have you ever used it? I know of Meetup, the website, and you can. This is another way to meet people to chat. That uh, there, there are probably a few different sites like this, websites and groups where you can 
You can find local groups in your town. So, for example, I know that even in Osaka, I know there's a Spanish meetup, right? Because I, 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 at least there used to be, that I went on that meetup website and I found that uh, there is it like some little group. They meet once a month, I think, and they just practice speaking Spanish to each other. So that's kind of cool, even in way over here in Japan. That's kind of surprised me. So you, you with English being the most common language that foreign language people are learning, there's a decent chance you can find a local group, just like a club, you know, like they just social group that meets maybe once a month, maybe once a week, and they just get together and talk in English. So you might try that. That's a good idea. Make, you can make some friends. Fatima says, I used your methods. They really work. Thank you. And congratulations to you, by the way. Yeah, Vladislav was mentioning like why you, you might not understand another speaker. And you understand me perfectly. Uh, other issues might be accent or their their speed. This is true also. Some people have, uh, actually, I think a lot of times it's idioms. They're using idioms or slang. That's a very common one. Or they might be speaking very fast. What about Jerry Maguire? Yes, we're doing Jerry Maguire this Sunday. Today's Thursday in Japan right now. So... Sunday. Alexi, you're in Ukraine. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if you're Russia or Ukraine. Namaz, babies are doing very well. As they say in Japanese, they're ginky, meaning they're healthy and energetic. So they're doing very well. Thank you. And Amy also asking, Annie asking about the babies. Thank you, everyone asking about the babies. They're doing very well. They're ginky babies now. I like that word. It's one of my favorite Japanese words, ginky. Yeah, like here's a very good point by Albert Amane. What I love about reading is your vocabulary increases unconsciously. Yes, this is what makes it fun, <laughs> okay? That you are absorbing, you know, like you're like a sponge and you're absorbing all these new words and phrases and you're not really consciously trying, right? It's not like like doing flashcards. It's like you're, uh, you know, you see the flashcard and you're, uh, what's that mean? Uh, you're testing yourself, right? And then you, you get it right or you get it wrong. If you get it wrong, maybe you feel a little stress. Like I feel a little stress when I do Anki sometimes. Just if I do it too much, it just kind of uh, makes me stressed out. I, I stop enjoying it. Um, but with reading, you're just reading. And when you're reading, just focus on the information or the story, whatever the book is about. And you're the you maybe you, you find a new word, you want to know the word, but you're not trying to memorize it like a test, like school. You just want to know it so you understand the meaning better. You're trying to understand the book. So maybe you use the dictionary, maybe you just guess, but often you just don't even realize how much vocab you're getting. And of course, it's passive vocabulary first. So you're building a huge amount of passive vocabulary, meaning you know it when you see it or hear it. Maybe you can't use it yet. That's active. Using it is active. Passive is you understand it. But still, really, the passive is more important. After you get to fluency, after you have those 5,000 words that are really common and you're, you can use them well, then you can say almost anything you need to with those words. But the challenge then is understanding everybody else, especially native speakers, right? And that's where you need this huge amount of passive vocab. And the reading is such a pleasant and powerful way to get it. Reading and adding in some audiobooks is very good. So you get the pronunciation and it trains your ears also. Alexi, I'll come back to your comment. Um, stick on the subject here and then I'll come back to that. Okay, now here's a, I'm going to, this is a very simple thing because this is some, this next question, something that teachers make very complicated and there's no reason. 
uh, uh, Sri Vastava says, how to get better in reading comprehension. And I'm not joking. This is a serious answer. Just read more. That's all you have to do. Read more. <laughs> okay. Read a lot. Okay. Just when you read a lot, you get better. You get faster. Some people ask me, how do I read faster? Read more. Okay, if you're reading is slow now, well, read more, it will get faster. Okay, like I can say right now, Japanese, for example, I, I, I don't know, super, 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 super slow. Even just in uh, using the alphabet, not the, the characters, using the, con, uh, the kana, it's called. I, I can read that, but so slow, so slow. How do I get faster? Do it more, read it more. So then I recognize Faster, faster, faster. It's no different. In Spanish, like I'm faster, of course, in Spanish, but not as good as English. How do I get better reading Spanish? Read more. <laughs> okay. In English, I'm super fast reading. Very, very fast. Why? Because I've read, I constantly read. I've read so many books. I read, read, read all the time. So now I'm very fast. I don't use any speed techniques. You know, I'm not trying to read fast. Uh, it's just because I read a lot. And so now I read in English very fast. So it's, and it's the same with your comprehension, with understanding. Well, comprehension, it means you need more vocabulary, first of all, right? If you don't understand the words, then your comprehension, your understanding is not going to be good. So read more, read more, your vocabulary grows more and more, and your comprehension gets better. So it's as simple as that. This is what I love about reading. It's so simple. Just do it. Just read a lot. That's all you have to do. Read a lot. Don't need any techniques. Don't need anything else. There's no skills involved. Uh, once you know the, you know, all of you can basically read the letters. And so you're, that's all you need to learn for children. They need those basic phonics, the basics in the beginning. And then after that, just read, read, read. That's all you got to do. It's very simple and so powerful. It's great. Yeah, now, Mikkel, good point. Without a doubt, your words are true. There's a little issue. I'd like to know a few months ago, if I had read books and listened to them at the same time, I might have avoided pronunciation mistakes. Yes. True. That's why I recommend, uh, not all. you don't always have to do it, but, but when you can, it's good to get the audio book also. It's good to also listen to it. So, in general, I think... It's nice to read it first because you can go slowly and learn some of the words, know the story, then go and, and then go back when you have maybe when you're driving or walking around, when you can't read, when you ha you're kind of doing something else, listen to the audiobook and then you then you'll hear the correct pronunciation. This is especially true in a language like English, where the spelling is confusing, right? Where you see a word and maybe it's not obvious how to say it, right? Some languages, uh, like Spanish and Japanese, both, in fact, the, the spelling and the, at least in the kana for Japanese, and the, in Spanish, like, you know, they, they spell and they pronounce almost always the same, which is great. <laughs> but in English, you know, that's not true. So it's very good to... Um, listen to audiobooks and it helps your listening too so it's just it's overall good yeah now here's seeing this is another example of how different speakers might feel easier to you or more difficult so abraham ali is talking about two business speakers keith cunningham is much easier than tom peters now i know both of these guys and that's exactly right they're business speakers they're both very good business speakers. They're native speakers. These guys do not teach English. They're not trying to speak more difficult or easier. Nothing like that. It's just naturally. Keith Cunningham, I believe, is I think he's from Texas, but he speaks more a little more slowly, naturally. He doesn't the, Tom Peters is from uh, I don't know originally. I think he lives up in the Northeast. They're famous for speaking fast. Tom Peters speaks fast. He's a business speaker. Tom Peters uses a lot of slang and idioms and things like that. He's a very emotional speaker, Tom Peters is, about business. So he's speaking fast. He's using idioms and slang. He's very emotional. For all of these reasons, 
He is more difficult to understand, probably for you, than Keith Cunningham. Keith Cunningham does not use as much slang or idioms. He naturally speaks more slowly. I believe he's from Texas. I might be wrong about that, but I think he is. He has a just a just a you know just a kind of more moderate. He's much less emotional um, when he speaks. So for all these reasons, he would be, probably be easier for you to understand. They're both native speakers in the same topic, business. So this this is just natural. It's going to happen, you know. Some, same with motivational speakers. You know, someone like Tony Robbins, many people say, oh, he's hard to understand. Why? He speaks very fast, very quickly. That's probably the main reason. He's a fast speaker. And he also is an emotional speaker. When people are emotional, they will often use more slang. They will often speak faster. They may use kind of different kind of words, more poetic language. All these things can make the... Uh, speech un more difficult to understand so don't feel bad about it it's just it's totally normal what's the name of the spanish book website oh the, both the spanish and the english that, that was amazon i was showing you for both of those amazon has some spanish books too yeah now see nasser is giving sort of like what is possible without reading i speak english fluently with almost zero reading skills i got that by a lot of listening and the movie technique. Fantastic. Good for you, Nasser. That's great. And as I said, you know, listening is the core. That's how you really do reach that fluency. It's just when you want to get to that. If you really want to expand your vocabulary a lot, uh, especially into, you know, less common topics and more complex topics, that's where the reading really can come in uh, and become powerful. Yeah, and I see you can, you're going to find these books in many languages. Larissa says there are adapted books for different levels in Russia. I started with them, and I also, along with such books, discs are sold. I listen, and then I understand, and then I just read. Also, it's, it's a perfectly good method. You can find these. There's a huge number of them in English. In most languages, you can find these. Oh, Hamadi is asking about my book. I want to buy your book on Amazon. Is the book attached with the audio? Do you have to buy the all buy the audio separately? Well, the audio book is free, but you have to download it separately. Just get the book in the back of the book. There's a website. Go there. Uh, it's now free. I think the in the book it might say it, there's a price, but it's free now. It's just effortlessenglish.com. You can down, get my audio book for free. Yeah, now, Albert Amani with an interesting point. It's very true. Understanding differs when we are in a bad mood, right? When we are sad or depressed, we just feel like we don't get as much compared to when we are happy and pleased or when you're stressed or tired. Absolutely, this is true, 100%. Your emotions also affect your understanding and your ability to speak a lot. Now, in Japanese, I notice this a lot huge amount because uh, most of the things I listen to in Japanese I have to focus I have to concentrate and when so for example I'm listening to many stories and uh, you know if I f focus on them if I really focus and listen and I've, I'm repeating them a lot okay so I know them fairly well so if I really focus I'm concentrating I understand you know maybe eh, depends 70 to 80 percent I understand but I also notice that sometimes I get tired and, or distracted or something. And it's like my understanding can go from 80 to almost zero <laughs> in like five seconds. It's, 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 and it's like this. It's concentration. It's emotion. It's tiredness. Like maybe I'm listening, you know, for an hour and then my brain just starts getting tired. And then a new mini story starts in the audio and I'll kind of, uh, I'm, my my energy's down a little bit low and I'm hearing the words and for maybe like one minute I'm just hearing all these Japanese words and I don't 
Like, the, I have no idea what it means. Like, I'm, I'm understanding zero. It's just blah, blah, blah. It's just sounds. And I know, I'm like, I, sh I know I should understand this. I, I, I know I know these words. I know this story. I've listened to it before. But I'm not even sure which story it is because my brain's tired and get I'm getting nothing. And then I'll, and what happens usually is I'll, you know, I'll try to focus and I'll, one word will pop out and I'll understand it. And, and it'll sort of like bring my focus. Get, I'll get my attention. My energy comes back. And then I, that one word, and then I start understanding the story again. It's really strange. <laughs> All right. I'll go from zero and then I'll jump back up to 70 or 80. So this, this is, this, it shows you that how concentration and emotion and stress can have a very big effect on your ability to understand. And especially, I, this really affects your speaking because we all know that even for native speakers, that your ability to speak with too much stress, your ability to speak can become almost zero. That's for your own language. And, you know, with the, the most famous examples for this are like public speaking and job interviews. Public speaking, like standing in front of a big group talking, you know, and maybe the audience, you're not sure if they're friendly. That's high, high stress. And suddenly you find it difficult to speak your own language. Just to say, to you're talking about a topic you know very well. So that's not a problem, but somehow it's hard to get the words out. Uh, uh, it's hard. You can't even remember what you want to say, right? Like your whole, like nothing's working. And this can happen in job interviews sometimes. You know, if you're stressed out in a job interview, they ask you some simple questions, you know, like, you know, why do you want to work here? Like, that's a pretty easy question, really. But you're just, uh, uh, you're so nervous that your, your brain just kind of like, stops and you, you uh, you're kind of struggling to speak and you're you, you're well I, I would like to um uh, 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 you know and that's that's your own language that the stress can destroy your ability to speak your own language so imagine what happens in English or in a foreign language and you're nervous about it because you know you're going to make mistakes. Uh, you're worried, you know, will the other person be annoyed with you? Um, or the, the worst situation for you, maybe, you have to do a job interview in English. You have to give a speech in English. Now the stress is super high. So yes, it don't feel bad if you find, oh my God, like I'm forgetting words. I can't remember what to say, like what happened to my ability to speak at home or with just some relaxed situation, I can speak very well. And then now I suddenly I can't speak. Or some people get nervous with native speakers. Some of you, if you speak to someone else who's also a student, also learning English, then you have no problem and your speaking will be better. But then you meet like an American or a British person and suddenly, uh, you, 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 oh, I can't speak. What happened? because you're nervous it's the it's the emotion it has a very strong effect so it's very important then we have to learn how to that's why we have to practice relaxing <laughs> when we're doing these things okay priscilla has a nice request for the show um let's see Hi, Jay. I'm from Brazil. I love you so much. Your podcasts and videos. Thank you for sharing your ideas. I'm addicted to them. Could you please do a show to teach English to young learners? I will. I'll be doing a lot of shows about this uh, as I want, you know, as my own babies start learning two languages. But I will do this. Yes, I'll talk about that. It's a nice topic. What's the next book we're going to read? Well, we're reading Your Money or Your Life right now. The next book, I don't know after that. Here's a nice quote from Alexi. Study while others are sleeping. Work while others are loafing. Loafing means like being lazy. Prepare while others are playing. Dream while others are wishing. Nice. And it kind of gives you the idea of people who succeed. They just do a little bit extra. Ah, uh, okay. Now, Namaz says, okay. 
there's a question. Namaz says, I have a I, I have a question. I'm listening to Oscar's unlimited Spanish, but can't understand anything. Do you think it's helpful to listen to Spanish without understanding? Can I learn it? Okay, well, here's what I recommend, Namaz. Read. So you're gonna have to read. He he gives you the text. So what I recommend is like just focus on lesson one. I can't remember what it is, but anyway, focus on the first lesson and read the Spanish and then look over at the English and read the English and try to start getting an idea for what it's about. And, uh, you know, if you might have to do some flashcards or Anki or something to learn some of the vocab for that first story. We have to do this in the beginning. You know, as we become intermediate, we can do it less. But in the very beginning with the language, uh, these kind of things are sometimes necessary. Um, so just do that. You know, try to learn... You don't have to learn all of it, but try to learn at least some of the vocab from the text for story number one. Um, then, at the same, then when you have time for listening, yeah, listen to it, listen to it again and again and again. And what will happen is, okay, right now you're just hearing Spanish sounds; it's like nothing, it means nothing to you. I understand this happens in Japanese to me all the time. But then, what can happen is, as as you use the text, then some of those words, you you're start to finally learn some words from the first story. They'll start popping out. You'll start noticing them when you listen, right? Like maybe, I don't know, comer, right? Maybe you learn comer, which means to eat. And uh, so first the story is just blah, blah, blah. You hear comer, it's not even a word. It means nothing to you. But when you're reading the text and you're using some flashcards or something, then you learn comer. And then after you learn it from reading, you're more likely to hear it in the story, right? So that when you hear Oscar say, comer, you know, ah, somebody's eating, <laughs> okay? And this will help. And little by little in this way, by repeating that first story many times, read the story, maybe every day, read the text in Spanish and in English and review some of the vocab, right? Try to learn some of the major vocab from that first story. Maybe you spend two weeks on the first story. I had to do this with the Japanese mini stories I'm using. You know, I had to, like the first 10 stories, I went very slowly, almost like a month to do 10 stories. And right? I just repeating the same ones again and again and again and again. And um, so if you do that, then eventually you'll start getting. And the good news is once you get the first story, then story two, story three, you'll already have some vocab. So there'll be fewer words to learn. But yeah, it's still. I think it's still good to get used to it. Just get used to the sounds of Spanish. Um, it's not enough. You have to also do the reading. But it's totally fine if you're just listening and you're not really even... You could even try shadowing just the sounds of Spanish without understanding the meaning at all. Alexander Argeles, the, the famous polyglot, recommends doing that. First, just shadowing without understanding anything. But this will help your brain start to pick... You'll start to hear the words. You don't know what they mean... But you will hear the word, for example, again, like you hear comer, right? And you hear comer, comer, comer. You have no idea what it means, but you know it's a word. You're hearing it now. So when you go to the text and you see comer and then you see the meaning, it means to eat. Ah, like it all kind of clicks in your mind much better. So give it a try, Namaz. I'm glad you're using Oscar's lessons. Those are great. Okay, I'm going to jump to the bottom and go back. Hmm. Okay, now here's the, the follow-up question about the interviews from Andy. When I have an interview in English... I can understand the person. I feel without confidence. What can I do? Well, that's hard. <laughs> um, my business English course kind of focuses on this a lot. You can, uh, you know, again, just improve your English, of course, but to deal with the emotional part of a job interview or public speaking. Why? I've got some YouTube videos on the topic. It's, it's a big topic, but go to my YouTube channel, AJ Hogue. And there's, I have a playlist about public speaking and job interviews and things like that. So watch that. I have a few techniques I teach you that can help you become less nervous during these uh, tough situations. This will help you.
Try to make an interview with Chris Hogan. I don't know who that is. I'll have to look it up. Uh, okay, this is a technical question. Kezong Dorji says, fluent speakers and native speakers are the same level. Fluent means how fast we speak or what. But you'll see a lot of, you know, there's not a clear definition for these. Uh, well, native speakers is there's a clear definition. Native speaker means someone who uh, learned a language from a baby. Right. So you're a native speaker. That's what it means. Native speaker. So I'm a native speaker of English because I learned English as my native language. Right. It's my the language of my parents. It's the language I learned naturally from a baby. So that's what native speaker means. Fluent. What does fluent mean? Well, people have many different <laughs> uh, definitions of fluent. The very general uh, meaning of the word fluent. Fluent is connected to the word fluid, which means like water. So it's something that moves like water, something that moves easily. So the, the, the most basic idea of fluent, speaking fluently, is the words come out easily. Right. In that way, it's kind of like a native speaker. Right. It means that you can communicate without uh, stopping and, uh, you know, you basic you can understand what the other person says in, you know, real time, instantly during a conversation. So it means you can communicate well, quickly and easily, effortlessly. That's why I call it effortless English. But there are different levels of fluency. I think we can talk about different levels of fluency because, you know, like I will say, there's kind of conversational, like basic or conversational fluency. That's the fluency of just like everyday normal topics, family, work, like kind of the stuff that everybody talks about all the time. That's where you have that 5,000 words of vocabulary, and you can use those words very quickly and easily. You understand them instantly. You can talk to normal people about normal stuff quite easily, right? But see, native speakers can do more than that. Most of them can. Um, so there, you, you might call it advanced fluency. You know, after that, there's kind of like all, you can just keep getting more and more advanced, right? So then where you talk about maybe deeper, more intellectual topics, you have to use much bigger vocabulary it's it's more difficult to say exactly what you're trying to say and that is a higher level of fluency to do that easily is requires a lot more vocabulary perhaps a little bit more complicated grammar and a lot more practice right so discussing like just talking about your family and eating and shopping is easier usually for most people, then talking about economics and philosophy and politics and religion and spirituality and, and these kind of more complicated, complex topics. Now, and it's a good point. The other thing about native is, see, native, like I said, it just means that you were born learning that language. But obviously, diff different native speakers have very different levels Right. You can have a native speaker with the Ph.D., with two Ph.D.s, who has a huge vocabulary, a huge amount of words. Right. And who trains as a public speaker who is very, very, very well spoken. You can also have a native speaker who, you know, didn't finish school, who hates, doesn't like to read, who has a very quite small vocabulary doesn't communicate very well at all. They're both native speakers, right? But anyway, that's what that's what those two words mean. Oh, okay, Emmanuel asking about Wim Hof. Do you recommend me doing the Wim Hof breathing technique along with meditation and push-ups because I noticed I'm more energetic in learning? Yeah, that's good stuff, man. W Wim Hof's good. You guys can look up Wim Hof on YouTube. He, they call him the Iceman. I have his book, one of his books. And uh, it's pretty cool, actually. Pretty cool stuff. He has a breathing technique he does. That one's easy. Anyone can do it. You can use the breathing technique with cold water, cold showers, if you want to.
Yeah, now see, like Lisa's, this is this is exactly what you can do. Lisa says, first I read and listened to the shortened story versions of some Jane Austen books. So a famous writer in English, Jane Austen, uh, what, Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, right? They've made movies about these two. She says, now I will read the whole novels. See, that's what's cool. And that's it's a great feeling, right? So first you read a graded reader, the simple versions of these stories. So she reads Jane Austen, but the simple, easy versions. Maybe Pride and Prejudice, for example. And she's reading a lot. Then now her vocabulary is enough. Now she can go read the real books. Read Pride and Prejudice. Read Sense and Sensibility. And then she can also rent the movies. There are several versions of these movies that are also nice. And you can kind of get this same story and really enjoy it deeply, first at a kind of lower level, and then when you get advanced, you enjoy the whole thing. It's kind of cool. Yeah, Marion, this is another... Marion is uh, saying, uh, reading can improve your vocab and writing skills. It definitely... And the well-read person doesn't have problems about grammar mistakes. Yes, it will help your grammar. For sure it will. Yeah, like Sachin, this is a point about, the again, the emotional, mental part. <coughs> yoga helps me concentrate more, whether it's listening or other stuff. Yes, things like yoga and meditation. And yoga really is meditation. Um they, they, this will help you. It helps you emotionally to keep calm in these situations and helps. It's, it's great concentration uh, training as well. You're training your mind to be more clear, more focused, more concentrated. Definitely helps. Definitely helps. Yoga, meditation. Okay, guys, I think it's time for me to go. Baby bedtime. Uh, Gulam, stop spamming. This is a general thing, guys. I pretty much, when people just post the same comment a hundred times, I just end up uh, hiding their comments on my site. <laughs> so just, you know, do it once. If you think I missed it, you can do it again, you know, a couple times. It's okay. I don't mind that. But like just writing the same thing, a copy and pasting it 10, you know, five times, 10 times, it's too much. Just distracts everybody. Okay, there are a lot of people on here and I can't answer every question. Yeah, no, this, is a, this is kind of a, a communication question. I'm going to end with this one from Alexi again. Do you think that eye contact is very important while you're speaking? Yes. I've noticed that successful men don't turn their eyes away. They look directly into the interlocutor's eyes. Nice vocab word there. Yes. Overall, from for general um, communication, Eye contact is important. Now, this varies by culture, however. So this is, uh, in American culture, it's important for sure. Uh, it's very different in Japan. In Japan, they, if like the American style of eye contact in Japan is kind of rude. It's too much. Like, like Japanese do not look, have the same amount of eye contact typically uh, that Americans do. So Americans, it's expensive. It's seen as very like strong and confident. So you're kind of expected to hold more. Eye Not always. You can't just do it nonstop because it makes you look crazy. <laughs> okay. But, um, but a fair amount, like a large amount, maybe let's say 80% of the time you're looking at the eyes, eyes, eyes. And then you maybe look at their mouth. You look away. You look back again. But you keep coming back to eye contact again and again. And in America, this is considered confident. It communicates confidence, which is positive and good. It's expected. If you don't, if you only have like 10% eye contact, you look not confident. But again, you have to be careful because uh, different cult it, it is different in different countries. So Japan, like that, um, that amount of eye contact, I've had to learn this myself, is too much. So I actually have to try to make a 
train myself to look down and look away more. So when I'm talking to, let's say, my wife's uh, family members, you know, like naturally I want to just, you know, lock their eyes, but it's too much. And I've, I notice it makes them uncomfortable, right? Um, it makes ge in general, I mean, they have some eye contact, of course, but it's just not as much as Americans. So it's, it's, uh, I have to do it a little bit less. So you have to adapt it to different countries. It's the same with, you know, distance, um, you know, like the, the body distance, right? The, the physical distance when you're talking. How close do you stand to somebody? You know, your face to their face. And I think we all know it's, it's, uh, it varies by culture. Now, in America, it's pretty far, right? In, uh, with, in American, it's like arm distance, I would say. You put, stretch your arm out in front of you and that's the amount of space that you want anything closer less space than that and americans get very uncomfortable and very irritated and they don't like it and i'm me too <laughs> okay it's just it's something that's you know you learn from it as a child and so it's just kind of unconscious so we like you know maybe it's because america's a big place <laughs> okay and we like to have a lot of space between us when we're talking not too close but there are other cultures where uh, that expectation is different and they, they get up in your face more. They get, there's less distance, right? And um, this can cause problems <laughs> when the, the two people are different cultures. So it's like if I go to some country and they're trying to get close and I'm like backing up, you know, trying to get more distance and they're trying to get closer and it's kind of comical sometimes. But overall, yes, if you, especially if you're dealing with Americans, uh, Strong eye contact is generally pretty good. Let's say 80% of the time. Don't do it 100%, but 80% would be about right. All right, guys, we'll be back again tomorrow. Uh, I know I saw Abraham requested an ASOP lesson again. Yes, it's on my list to do that. We're going to get back into your money or your life, do the next chapter, and we're going to start on Twitch on Sunday. We'll start Jerry Maguire, hopefully on Sunday. Or babies let me do it. Okay, as always, uh, go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com, join my VIP program and Business English Conversations course. EffortlessEnglishClub.com